go. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Today we have with us Jared Casey and Ollie Wesker. And Ollie is a UK libertarian involved in networking among grassroots and following the various literature and discussions in the, uh, in the space over the past decade. I became friends with him a few years ago and he's a fascinating guy and I'm glad to have him on. Dr. Casey, he's a renowned teacher, author and scholar <laughs> and I might give you a little anecdote um, rather than list everything that he's done because that's quite a long list and say that when I came across him, his student, Oscar Johansson, was a friend of mine and he, he was looking at helping me with a conference in 2013. And I was saying, I was talking about speakers and he said, well, uh, actually my um, PhD supervisor, if I got it correct, is Dr. Casey and he put me in touch and, and Dr. Casey came to the conference and he, he spoke and he didn't, he didn't ask for anything. He didn't, I didn't arrange anything for him. He just did it all. And I think that might be a better testament to his character than saying um, he holds, here we go. He holds law degrees from the University of London and UCD as well as primary degree in philosophy from University College Cork an MA and PhD from University of Notre Dame and a higher doctorate, which is a, a DLIT, from the National University of Ireland. He was formerly assistant professor at the C Catholic University of America in Washington. And between 1983 and 1986, an adjunct professor at the Pontifical Institute in Washington. He was a member of the School of Philosophy in at the University College Dublin between, 18, sorry, between, <laughs> between 1886 and 2015, apparently, an extra 100 years. Um, <laughs> Between 2001 and 2006, he was, uh, he was the head. And he's a fellow of the Mises UK, which some of you may be aware of, and an associate scholar of the Ludwig von Mises Institute. So after that long introduction, uh, I'd like to welcome you both. Thank you, Andy. Brilliant. Okay, so I'd, I'd like to kick off and maybe ask um, Dr. Casey first, maybe an outline of your history of, I don't know whether it began in your teens or, or early 20s, but when you started looking at life in, let's say, the philosophical way of sort of how do I want to live rather than how, how are things in the world? Um, what makes me tick? And how those frames sort of grew with you? Oh, <laughs> I was saving this for my autobiography. Uh, the, <laughs> the trouble all began when I was about 16. And uh, I had sort of inchoate questions. And the very nature of inchoate questions or inchoate anything is that they don't have a shape. So, um, uh, and I, I grew up in what was then 1960s Cork, which is a provincial town in Ireland, suffers from the second town syndrome. <laughs> okay. Uh, and uh, it's a small place, very local, very parochial. Uh, if you wanted anything, of course, this is pre-internet by, by many, many years. Um, I had practically read everything in the library, um, but I still had questions. And uh, so when I was in the, in, the, in the bookshop, I came across a book by uh, Bertrand Russell called Why I'm Not a Christian. And I read it and it, whoa, it, it was sort of, like, sort of like an explosion went off in my head and I discovered philosophy. Uh, and then I read everything I get my hands on as quickly as I could, including, and I don't know whether this is a boast or a confession of stupidity, but I actually read Locke's essay on human understanding from cover to cover. That's 900 pages. I don't know anybody else who's ever done that. I wouldn't recommend it to anybody. I'm a big Locke fan, but you know, that's, that's one hell of a book. And then, uh, so when I was, so, and uh, of course, um, for almost everyone who starts philosophy, uh, philosophy begins as an existential quest. Uh, it may degenerate into a technical exercise, as it tends to do for many people, but, and philosophers are very often ashamed to admit <laughs> that the reason they got into it in the first place is because they had existential problems like, what the hell am I doing here? <laughs> what is this crazy thing called life? What, what, and so on. Uh, does life mean anything? Does it make any difference what you do? And so on. All of these kind of humdrum, um, but very basic questions to which there are no easy answers. And then I gave up. By the way, stop me when, <laughs> when you've had enough. Uh, I, I gave it all up when I was 20 because it wasn't making me happy. And I figured I could be miserable without spending money on it. So I sold all my books and said, that's it. I'm never going to do philosophy again. Goodbye. And of course, <laughs> so what am I doing? At the same time, by the way, uh, as I discovered philosophy, it wrecked my school career because I was sublimely uninterested 
in almost everything that was going on in, in my school. And I regarded, in fact, uh, my schooling as a form of involuntary incarceration. And I couldn't wait to get out of there. So once it finished, I, and, and, the, and I felt these sort of prison doors close behind me as I left. I thought, that's it. Never again will I enter the gates of an educational establishment. <laughs> Once again, here we are. So, uh, yeah, so then I, then I messed around for a long while. I did a bit of traveling, did a bit of work, worked on the continent, lived in the Netherlands for a year. And while I was there, this is, this is the short version, by the way, Andy, just in case you're wondering. Um, while I was there uh, working in a beer factory, uh, of all places, uh, which is ironic since uh, I don't drink and never have. <laughs> okay, um, but I worked in the spear factory, and then all of these kinds of questions came back. And because of the circumstances in which I found myself, uh, my command of Dutch was very limited, um, because all of the Dutch people I was with wanted to practice their excellent English, and nobody wanted to listen to my rotten Dutch. And, uh, but nonetheless, for most of the day, I was on my own. I couldn't listen to any music or radio, couldn't talk to anybody. And all of these questions come back. And so I was faced with a decision. So either I decided, either there were only two ways to deal with this. One was to get drunk and stay drunk, <laughs> okay, or, you know, go on drugs or get distracted with. If I'm, I'm not going to make any Irish jokes here, but carry on. Okay, all right, okay. Uh, or, or else face up to them. So I saved up my money. I came back to Ireland. I worked for a year. And I went to university in the middle of my, I was about 24. And I've never escaped. I've been firmly institutionalized until they kicked me out yeah. in 65. Okay, I spent the rest of the time there. So that's really it, that's the beginnings. So, you, so, you're, so you're like, uh, so you're like the, in, the, in the films where someone has been in prison for so long that, uh, that they can't handle the outside world anymore. And so. <laughs> or you get the Stockholm syndrome, you know, where, you can, where you're comfortable in your bliss, blissful ignorance. Yeah, well, it might be that. It's just that I, I've always felt, even, uh, I had such a wonderful time as an undergraduate, just arguing and discussing um, that all, all that happened really was that that continued into into a job. I, I never really, in fact, I hadn't planned to do graduate studies. It just sort of happened. And there wasn't anything else, um, you know, attracting me. So I just went with it, with, with it and finally ended up, if you like, as a, as a philosophy teacher. But, you know, but at least two or three occasions um, during my career, I, I was tempted just to give up, uh, you know, that it wasn't for me. And, and the thing that really kept me going largely was uh, the teaching side, the thing that most uh, professional academicians don't really, uh, aren't interested in and, and don't much concern themselves with. Um, you know, but the whole, the whole of academia and the publishing and the perishing and the academic administration and the academic politics and all of that sort of stuff just drove me absolutely mad. Um, so while I was in the middle of, of that career, I, that's when I did law, I was, I was thinking at the time of switching. Um, I didn't. Uh, I stayed, um, but I enjoyed. Uh, I enjoyed doing the law for for well, if, for no other reason than it served as a check to see if my brain was still working. Yeah, <laughs> something I wasn't sure about, and and so on. So that's it, really. Um, but I've always felt like a stranger in a strange land. I I, I always felt uh, I suffered for, uh, to a large extent from uh, I suppose an exaggerated amount of imposter syndrome. Uh, one of these days, my students were going to find me out. Even worse, the university establishment was going to find me out, and they were going to fire me. Um, and uh, yeah, there we are. So oh, that's, that's a good. That's a good start. I'll keep asking you about that um, further. But Ollie, but, if we can maybe maybe just oh sorry, Richard, go. Just a quick quick interjection here, just for the uh, listening audience, is that just before I I came on to this discussion, um, <clears throat> Andy, uh, some years I think about five years ago, two thousand thirteen. Uh, he hosted a conference in, I guess, in the UK, in London. And um, uh, one of his speakers was Mr. Casey. And Mr. Casey's topic is on the law. And I highly recommend uh, uh, listening to that, uh, that uh, talk that he gives. Um, we're going to be talking somewhat about the law, too, but you don't want to miss that. And I'll link it once I put this video up. Okay. Andy, Brilliant. So, so, yeah, Ollie, similar thing for you. Maybe, you know, what was your, what was your path to sort of thinking along these lines? And, and how do you think it helps you? Sort of similar vibe. Um, well, libertarianism, um, uh, I guess it, 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 the roots of it are in the savings and loans crisis in the 80s. Uh, my, my family was uh, bitten rather, rather viciously 
like that. Um, so you had quite a change in economic circumstance, which sort of um, cemented a very deep interest in the economy and um, how it's affected by, by politics and such. Um, I apologize for noise in the background, we have builders around at the moment. Um, and uh, so uh, when I was, uh, I was exp expatriate, I was living in France for a long time, and uh, it's very, very political um, culture over there. But France is very, very interested in politics, and it's, it's very strong. Um, so I took an interest in it, I think, at school there. Uh, I came to university in England and uh, discovered the, the politics on campus. Discovered some, well, made some good friends, actually, who I'm still friends with, who also shared an interest, people from around Europe. And um, I got involved, uh, slightly ashamed to say, in rather left-wing politics. Uh, <laughs> didn't say outright Marxist, but that was certainly on the fringe. Um, I, I was more, uh, more drawn towards more anarchist um, streams of thought. And um, I finished university, uh, you know, joined the economy and uh, started working. Uh, got quite upset with the whole situation, um, the regulated market, if you will. And um, I had a, a sort of relapse into uh, political activism and uh, was involved with uh, some, some eco-warriors and, uh, and lots of left-wing groups. Again, not going quite the full Marxist hold, um, but um, in those circles. But all along, um, the, my interest in economics, um, you know, it, it ultimately led me to the Mises Institute around, around the time of Ron Paul's first run at, um, at the presidency. And he just gave me some great answers about um, how, how the economy works and uh, the, the impact of, of the government and, and its colossal power. Can I pause you there, Ali, just to ask, what was your first book on libertarianism? I'll tell you mine was actually um, Ron Paul's uh, something liberty what was it defining liberty is it i think it is, is it the manifesto or something like that? something something liberty it's a very very simple book and it sort of it did its work with me anyway what was your first book um so mine was actually an e economics book i got involved on the um mises.org forums and um is it henry hazlitt mm. uh, the economics in one lesson one person, yeah, yeah. Um, the classic the classic okay <laughs> yeah very, very shortly after that um uh came across another Austrian book. Oh, no, actually it was a Chicago school book. Uh, I forget his name now, black guy. Thomas Sowell. Thomas Sowell, yeah. Might have been Thomas Sowell, yeah. Um, and Graham um, Thomas Sowell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Great guy. So that, that, those are my first books. I've, I've read a few books. I've probably only read about half a dozen uh, libertarian books. Uh, most of my learning comes from involvement on the forums and um, on social media, you know, we've got access to, to the greats of the Austrian school. I've, I've had um, endless conversations with uh, people like Stephen Kinsella, um, Stefan Molyneux, um, all, all sorts of people from a broad spectrum of, of the Austrian school particularly, but also people who are more Friedmanite. Um, and yeah, so I've been there pretty much ever since. Really. Let, me, let me take a poll on two books. <laughs> Yes, have any of you ever read uh, David Friedman's uh, Machinery Freedom? Yes. Okay, yeah. I was, I was talking the other, I think with Andy about that. Uh, uh, I, I, I bantered with David uh, way back in on a place called Usenet, talking mid-90s uh, back then. Okay, second book, uh, since uh, Mr. Casey is uh, interested in philosophy of law, and, and we're going to get into that. Have, have any of you read the book, uh, The Enterprise of Law by, I think, Bruce Benson? Benson. Yes. <laughs> excellent, excellent book. Right. Rich, can we make a rule? If you, if you call Dr. Casey, Mr. Casey again, you have to wear your, your glasses upside down. Okay. For three episodes again. Yeah, I, I, th I think if we're Richard, Ollie, and Andrew, I'm going to be Jared, okay? So let's... Okay, okay, we'll do that. That's fine, that's fine, that's fine. Yeah. So yeah, Ollie, I, I think you had a question for Dr. Casey. Um, yeah, um, this is just something I've not, not really heard your, your view on, um, so I'd be curious to find out. I've, um, I've heard you speak about law and, and uh, various topics around libertarianism, but not so much about money. And um, mm -hmm. I was curious to hear what your thoughts were on, on cryptocurrency, uh, Bitcoin perhaps in its relation to value, um, you know, just your thoughts on, on, on that whole sphere. Yeah, it's a, well, first of all, very nice to meet you. 
uh, even if it's only electronically. <laughs> okay. An honor, an honor on my end. No, no, no. Um, it's, it's odd that you should ask me that because it was actually through money that I came to libertarianism. I had, a, if you'll, again, you know, please shut me up if I go on too long, but I had this kind of question. I was always puzzled by the fact that you could hand somebody a grubby piece of paper <laughs> and they would give you goods and services. And they thought, well, I've got lots of pieces of paper around. Okay, why is it that these ones uh, attract goods and services, but the other ones, which, you know, have Bank of Jared Casey on them, don't seem to uh, have the same <laughs> results? What, what's the magic in it? And um, so I, I would, you know, discuss these things with my colleagues or in, the, in, the, in, the, in the department. And one of them went off uh, on a year sabbatical to Germany. He was uh, interested in German philosophy. And when he came back, he brought me back a book. And that book was A Theory of Money and Credit by Ludwig von Mises. Oh, no. so it started easy, I see. You started with something nice and nice. And, well, you know. well, this is what I was going to say. If you were to recommend somebody the book not to start with, right? This is the book. I mean, this is a Teutonic book. You know, what my, one of my former professors used to say to me, Mr. Casey, uh, when, when you read a French book, uh, ignore the footnotes. They're only there for decoration. Uh, when you read a German book, read only the footnotes. <laughs> <laughs> and so <laughs> the theory of money and credit is a German book. I mean, you know, it's tough. But the point was that I, it answered my question, all right? And this is one of the things that I, I, I'm sure everybody's experienced. The times in your lives, you, could, you can read something and it doesn't actually respond to any questions that you actually have. And therefore, it, you know, sort of, it just goes by you. And at other times, you know, you could read the same thing five years later, and it's like a revelation. And this book, uh, this, this is by way of an answer to all these questions, uh, was a revelation to me because it, it, it explained what money was and how it came to be. And indeed, not only that, not only was it, if you like, a speculative uh, account, but it, it, had the, it had the character that once you, once, you saw, once you understood it, you saw that not only was it true, but it had to be true. It couldn't really have come about in any other way. And this was the real shock. So, so that was my introduction to, and, and, and like you then, I fell into the, uh, into, uh, into the gravitational power of the Mises website and read about a million things in the space of like six months and so on and so forth. On, when it comes to cryptocurrencies and so on, you're talking to the wrong guy in a sense. I'm, I'm not a complete know nothing in this area, but I, in fact, I have to admit that I had to ask my son who works in IT just a week ago, and this is really embarrassing to have to admit, I asked, what is a blockchain? How does it actually work? And so at the moment, I'm plowing through a book to try to figure out how this actually works, right? Um, but it's all, it's all in the general area of money and exchange and so on. So I, I, more than that, I can't really say. I have no particular insights into it. Um, the what I'm more interested actually well sorry I'm I'm interested in cryptocurrencies just as such but I'm also interested in the extent to which uh, if I can actually attain some kind of understanding of the technology behind it particularly blockchain and so on it can actually feed into other libertarian interests that I have in the sense in, in which um, a an order can be created and maintained without a central authority which of course is of huge significance to anybody who's interested in libertarianism. Yeah, Jared, I'd like to say a point on that. She's, uh, there's a friend of mine called Johan Gevers who's, who runs a company called Monetas in what they call Crypto Valley in Zug in uh, Switzerland. There's a lot of information in one sentence. So Johan Gevers <laughs> talking about um, the decentralization uh, from blockchain and how it can be used to reduce costs for let's say an African farmer buying a phone to be able to trade grain across the Velt, the Svelte, um, with, um, with another trader. Anyway, yeah, that's an interesting thing. I think some sprung to mind with a book that got me. So you both started on uh, economics. I had this sort of that Ron Paul book that came along. But another book that struck me <laughs> later was actually um, something that delineated how I look at the world now. And I can't really pull away from it. I haven't really found a way, which is to split the world into how things are and how to live. Mm. And I think several people through their life have struggled to try and integrate those two or separate them. And I think every single one of them has failed to separate them, whether it's 
uh, Dostoevsky or even Shakespeare, mm. all, all these different people, have, and then they've come to the conclusion you have to you have to treat them separately. They're inter intertwined. And so the book that got me, it was about midnight on a I think on a Tuesday night about three years ago, and I just I decided to pick up Leo Tolstoy's A Confession, which oh. is a, it's a sort of autobiography. It's eighty. It's, it's quite short. And as I read it, I just suddenly thought a parallel. He's from an aristocratic family in Russia during, well, basically it, par it paralleled mine somewhat. And the struggles he went through, he was speaking to all these intellectuals and all these authors, and he, was, he wasn't finding any reward in their sort of sanctimonious, oh, look at how we can describe the world. And a lot of, like how libertarians do, we say, oh, the world could be a lot better if, if it was done our way. Some, you know, all sorts of people say that. And so as I read this book, Leo Tolstoy just really, really spoke to me. And he, he mentioned how he went off and had a struggle trying to understand science. He, he studied you know, biology and chemistry, everything of the time he could. He had the money and he had the assets and time to do it. But nothing made sense. And he got to this sort of stage of existential crisis, beyond even angst, that he, his, his phrase was something like he couldn't carry a rope or scissors in his hand through fear of hanging himself or, or slicing himself. And it sounds bonkers, but I think what pulled him out was his faith and i think not not only his faith but his splitting of that faith of that sort of world of this is science this is how i can improve this is how i can yield more money and more goods and then the other side which you might call experience and i think that delineation for me has been revelatory hmm. uh, one thing one thing i uh, to um, um address um uh, dr casey's um um, I got it right. Uh, thoughts on, on Bitcoin, blockchain, cryptocurrency in general um, is, you know, I've dabbled in it and uh, quite a bit and going, going back. Um, my recommendation for anyone is, you know, uh, stick with the tech, understand the technology and, and how it can be useful and how it can um, uh, eventually come to be something that everybody uses um, uh, regularly. And ignore the, ignore the price against whatever your home currency is, the price against dollars or, or mm. whatever, because it will drive you crazy, right? So, uh, you know, there's, a, there's an old saying, um, you know, a long time ago, uh, some, some, um, some guy in some forum somewhere, some uh, cryptocurrency forum, he says he was going to hold his cryptocurrency, not, in other words, not sell it, but he misspelled it. So he, he, instead of hold, he, he so it was, H O D L <coughs> HODL. So that's the, that's the, that, and you'll hear that if you ever get involved in cryptocurrency, um, I'm going to HODL. So that means you're going to hold. So it's stuck and it just became me a cryptocurrency <laughs> meme. Okay. Who's next? <laughs> yeah. So Ollie, can I ask you a question? That's all right. Um, you, so you, in your introduction, you said that you're, your experience um, in your younger years, your political experience was on the left. Yeah, Is that correct. So, what what moved you? In, in, sorry, in a way, I mean, I, I'm I'm not particularly patient with the whole left right thing because, in a sense, I and so on. But nonetheless, um, what. And one of the things I find as well is that there are actually similarities between sort of convinced libertarians on the one hand of our persuasion and, and convinced sort of leftists as well. Uh, and I appreciate people who are committed, by the way, and so on. I, I think it's good. But what moved you? What, what, what kind of shook you? Uh, it was the economics. The, the economics. economics. Right. Mm. And, and, uh, and the Mises Institute provided answers, which uh, those on the, on the left really couldn't provide. Mm. And um, yeah, essentially that. I mean, they didn't didn't have the answers, and and the only answers they 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 would provide were not rational to me, um, yeah. especially on the Marxist side. So I just could never. That's why I could never actually go the full way to the left, yeah. you know, just because it became more and more economically irrational. And, and um, yeah, just uh, I had that fundamental understanding of economics. I think you know intuitively, and it it, it did not resonate with the left. But when I heard the the Mises Institute. Uh, and the Austrian school, and and I guess broader ideas on the right, it just was there was less of a barrier, less of an intellectual right. barrier. It's it's um all you know it's it's interesting, uh, Ollie, that you you mentioned about how the Marxist just doesn't make, doesn't make Marxism doesn't make sense, and you know the the chief the chief thing that doesn't make economic sense 
but yet almost everybody operates by to some extent is the labor theory of value the idea the idea that it's, right. it's the labor that goes and we see it right now like a, there's a big thing in the uh, um, new not only the 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 the, the proposed federal in the U.S. federal um, minimum wage, um, who knows, you know, great way to destroy jobs. Um, <laughs> you know, if you, if, you, if you go to McDonald's uh, now here in the United States, you see more and more of these automatic kiosks and, and everything. So, and, 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 and before long, it's going to be robotics making the stuff in the back and you'll just need one or two people to, you know, maintain everything and fill the machines. But anyway, the other big one, is the is the is the U.S. Uh, women's soccer team? Yes. <laughs> I'm not a big fan of, of soccer, and I, I heard an interesting quote uh, or a funny quote the other day um, by uh, by Ann Coulter of all people, who said that the only thing more boring than soccer is women's soccer. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> now I know I'm I know I'm, I'm uh, you know I should be calling it football, and I'm talking to three gentlemen who are probably football fans. So I, I don't mean to be insulting, but, but the, but the whole idea, you know, equal pay. And this is based on a, on a notion of labor theory of value. You know, they're out there kicking the ball around. So, and so are the guys. So they should get equal pay rather than looking at what revenue does the team generate. And in fact, if you look at the revenue that the, that the men's team and the women's team make, the, the women are getting a, a bigger chunk of the gross revenue than the men are. It's just that <laughs> the men make a, a, a exponentially more uh, income. Uh, you know, the team generates more income than the women do. But so can many- Can I make a point on this, Richard? Oh, go ahead. Just, go. just quickly on the, on the equal pay for equal work. I think it's, all, it's best described by Morgan, um, sorry, not by Morgan, by Milton Friedman, uh, in a two, three minute clip that we can link below to this when he talks about it and just says how it makes no sense. But I like Jordan Peterson's point that how do you decide what is equal work? Because pay is for responsibility. I pay you for the responsibility of getting that work done or, you know, that's, that's one way of looking at it. So if I have two, uh, two people doing a job for me, who've both got the title of, you know, marketer or accountant or whatever, am I going to divvy up exactly the same for one as the other? Almost never. So you can have two people with the same job title with the same general, happening over one two years and the better companies will generally pay the person who has more responsibility more for obvious reasons so anyway that i was just making a point on that i think actually deciding what is equal work it's not so much about the pay it's more about the work it's that it's about the the subjective value again trying to destroy the subjective by saying the values in the object is that thing that that, that tolstoy couldn't do this the thing that almost drove him mad i if I can uh, come in, I, I had some success in getting this point across to my students. I, uh, I said, look, suppose I, uh, I have a strange hobby of building um, little models from used lollipop sticks, you know, things you have ice cream on. Okay. So, uh, and suppose that I've spent 20 years building a lollipop stick replica. Oh, I don't know, the whole of center of Paris or something like this. It's amazing. And so I work out and say, well, let's take the minimum wage per hour and let's multiply it by the number of hours I've worked over the number of years. So I reckon this, if, I, if we go on that um, scheme of things, this is worth about, oh, I don't know, $5 million. Okay. And I say, well, okay, try and get anybody to give you that kind of money for it, right? <laughs> Nobody's going to do it. Something is worth what it's worth to you, what you're prepared to give for it, okay? It doesn't matter how much attached you are to it, how much time you put into it and so on, how wonderful you think it is and so on. In the end, it doesn't really matter. It's um, a, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, uh, there was a case, uh, I, I'm, uh, it's, it's going to come up in my next book. Um, so it's, 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 I mean, the idea of same work, in fact, is problematic because it's very, I mean, unless you get down to something like very basic, like cleaning a floor where there's not really that much, difference in what any two people can do, provided they've got two hands on a brush. Uh, for anything else, it's almost impossible to figure out, you know, what exactly the same work is. But in, in one case, uh, and this occurred, I think, about a year ago, in Tesco, the, the, the largely female workforce who operated the tills uh, have taken an action against Tesco uh, because 
the men, largely men, who work in the warehouse and drive the trucks are paid more per hour. So this, <laughs> this is not a claim for the same pay for the same work, whatever that means. It's actually, we want the same pay for different work. <laughs> And I thought that was amusing. And I thought, well, there's nothing to stop any lady who wants to sit in a, you know, one of these forklift trucks and go around doing it. I presume do it. You want to do that? Want to work in a nice drafty warehouse, you know, with the rain and so on, instead of sitting in your nice comfortable tail? Go ahead and do it. I thought it was amusing. Uh, but I was bound to come. Not only do we go from the insanity of the same pay for the same work, which is crazy anyway, to uh, the same pay for different work. Okay. It's I it's great to have it's great to have an a, an analogy like your like your lollipop or, or popsicle uh, kind mm -hmm. of thing and and well I put this much work in it and so it must be worth this um, because of the um, amount of labor I put in it to it and not what someone will will pay you for it um, my own my own analogy uh, analogy that I've used for years and years uh, to to kind of you know when someone gives a labor theory of value. A sort of argument about anything. It's like, I don't care how hard anybody works making mud pies. They're mud pies, right? Yeah. So it's the same, same, sort of, uh, same sort of thing. Yeah. I think also with the labor theory of value, the idea of intrinsic value in the object or the work or whatever it is, is it, it, it sort of demonstrates in the person who espouses that view, a lack of consideration for other people's values. And by virtue of that, a, a lack of interest in cooperating with other people or ability to cooperate with other people. Mm. I think it's very telling. I, I would call it solipsistic even to say that, you know, what matters is what I've put into this. Um, the way I look at value, I'll just, just elucidate, which is, I think, we look at, I first looked at it as, like most people, you know, I, I mixed up the value of my height being 180 whatever centimetres and the value of, liking you more than you or x more than what you know they're two different values that one isn't a, you see what i mean i mix those two up, obviously one as a child and then i came across i just sort of thought everything has a value just sort of instinctively and then i still to this day have not found a better single lesson and i say this again and again uh, than value is and can only ever be subjective there's there's no better le i've found no lesson that permeates more areas of my life than that but then recently I've started to think that actually it's, this is just a model in my head. It's not the truth. Um, I've started to think of value as like a, a, a relationship between me and an object or sort of like, you know, so I, I decide to value the game of football or the game of tennis. Nadal's playing Federer right now, by the way, but I'm not thinking about that. Um, and <laughs> you, you model that and, and, it's, it's not just that I can impose any value on anything. I can go, well, I think I'll, I think I'll just hate tennis for the next 10 years. Right, go. You, it, it's not that we don't work like that. We work like an integration of experience and obviously genes and that sort of those things that have happened to us. And then we set upon the object. We need to actually focus on the object for it to become into our vision. And then, you know, the valuation, I'm not saying I know the order of the process, but that's kind of how I look at value now, more of an integration between the subject and the object. Anyway. Mm. So do you, uh, do you think it's a, it's a good time to, uh, to switch over and, and start talking a bit about uh, law? And, um, and I had, uh, since, um, since uh, Dr. Casey is uh, Irish from Ireland, I had wanted to ask him about uh, Brehon Law. If, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. Yep, pretty good, Brehon, yep. Okay, I don't know if you can see this. Can, can everybody yeah. see this? Yes. yes, it looks it looks uh, interesting. Yes. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So so it's it's called a guide to early Irish law by Fergus Kelly. It's a production of the Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies, and uh, what it, so if anyone's really interested in this, this is the book you should get. Um, it's it's a it's an amazing work of scholarship, but eminently readable, and it it gives a survey of all of the of the law text which. Uh, which were originally written down in the early Christian era, but, but obviously predated in, in oral form. Uh, and many of them then were redacted in the 15th century. So the Brehan law system is the original Irish law system, which in fact managed to survive fully functionally until the early 17th century, and even staggered on after that for another century before finally collapsing. Uh, under the pressure of the introduction of what would, from an Irish perspective, have been English law uh, into Ireland. 
Yeah. So it's, uh, what did you, maybe I better ask you, Richard, what did you want to ask me about it? Uh, Oh, uh, well, uh, I, I just wanted to, we want, I wanted to uh, talk uh, uh, about it and, and perhaps you can, can, you can guide the conversation or Ali or, uh, or uh, Ollie or Andrew. Um, but uh, I was, I was doing a little um, familiarizing myself with it yesterday to, to t try and determine, you know, how close it is to our notion of, um, of, uh, you know, I, it's just like a kind of 10 minute, uh, um, you know, degree in, in, in <laughs> just to find out, you know, uh, how similar it might be in concept to, uh, to our conception of, uh, of common law, you know, British common law. But then another thing that I was very interested in, and that's, it, it's why I mentioned, uh, Bruce Benson's the enterprise of law. And I also mentioned David Friedman's uh, machinery of freedom because going way back, um, one of the things I learned from, from, David Friedman over the internet and discussions was about the, uh, I think it's called the uh, uh, law sayers. So when it was more of an oral uh, tradition, um, th then it was, uh, and I, I was looking at your, watching your talk earlier uh, today reminded me yet again of this idea that, you know, it used to be that uh, people understood everybody if you were a normal, rational person, you could you could know all the pretty much all the law. And the idea of having the law sayer is 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 really that notion that someone should be able to recite the whole law. So leading to the idea of well, if he does, if he can't remember, it's not really the law anymore. <laughs> right? so, some some notion like that. But but today, you you know, the, the, there's a saying or an idea, at least in America, probably, probably it's universal at this point, that, that, that because of the enormity of the, of the of laws, which is, which is primarily statutory law, um, you know, you can be in, in, in violation of some law or another, you know, virtually 24 seven without even knowing it. Hmm. Yeah, um, that's absolutely true. I used to invite my students to go look uh, at the law library in UCD. And I would say, you know, if you, if you, if I told them where it was, and I said, if you look along the top shelf, you will see statutes ranging from here to here. And I said, who knows the law? And the answer is, as one judge memorably said, actually, when, when uh, one of his barristers said he didn't know the law on this, he said, you know, Mr. Murphy, no one knows the law, <laughs> okay, which is true. Um, but the, the, the brand law was a, wasn't unique. I mean, it was a form of law common to, I suppose, to pre-modern societies in Ireland, in what is now Britain, in the continent in Germany, and in other places. And the idea is that the, the law wasn't made by a lawmaker. In other words, the idea that there would be somebody whose job it was primarily to make a law is an incredibly modern, and I think, disastrous idea. Right, um, but rather that the law emerged from the efforts of people to live together in a community in the particular geographical and economic circumstances in which they found themselves. Right, so in order to avoid conflict and 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 to increase wealth, certain ways of doing things simply emerge, and before long they're codified, and and then people grow up uh, organizing their life in accordance with them, and so they understand them in that sense, and everybody knows the law. Most basically, of course, uh, the law relating to person and property. In other words, uh, it doesn't really <laughs> it doesn't really take much to figure out that it's probably not a good idea and a contribution to the stability of society if a certain group of people are allowed to go around punching other people in the face at random <laughs> without punishment, or killing them, okay, or raping the women, or stealing their property or appropriating it or cheating and all of these kinds of things. The things that are, are described when you do your philosophy of law, things that are described as malum in se, things that are wrong in and of themselves in every society. Yeah, that, Jared, reminds me of, um, of the Nuremberg trials. You know, Alexander Solzhenitsyn said the most important to him uh, event of the, the 20th century was the judgment in Nuremberg because it said that you can be guilty of certain acts despite being ordered to do them. They are, they are, Malaman say, they are, they are wrong in and of themselves. Yeah, no, that's true. 
Now, that, that being said, um, you know, uh, certain, certain things in any legal system are adventitious. They depend on circumstances. So, for example, in, in this side of the Atlantic, uh, the law uh, relating to neighbors and uh, damaged property, say from cattle or animals, is that if you have large animals, you are obliged to fence them in. Right, And therefore, if your cattle or your sheep trespass on your neighbor's land and destroy his goods, you're responsible if you didn't maintain the fence between them. Obviously, for example, if you go to the, you know, what is now the United States and the, and the, and the uh, areas where cattle grazing in the 19th century took place, can you imagine what kind of a burden it would be actually to fence your animals in? Right? And therefore, in, that, in those circumstances, if you were, if you, if you were a... Um, a homesteader and you were farming okay it was your obligation to fence the animals out right so those kinds of decisions if you like it's a bit sort of like which side of the road do you drive on it doesn't really in other words if you're driving very very slowly it doesn't make any difference i've seen some footage of my own hometown from about 1904 where there are early sort of cars and there are horses and donkeys and 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 pedestrians and cyclists everybody's going every which way it doesn't matter because nobody's going fast enough to cause anybody any damage. It doesn't make any difference. But eventually you have to decide which one you're going to do on. You can't say, oh, I think I'll drive if on this side of the Atlantic anyway, uh, on the right hand side today, just for a bit of excitement. <laughs> well, you can, yeah. and it would be exciting, but it would be a short lived form of excitement. There's so a, by and large, it, the core, sorry, sorry. Oh, I just want to interject real quick. There, uh, on that, there is a, there is a, I forget the, the there's a, there's a, a a town or a series of towns in um, somewhere in like uh, Scandinavia where they eliminated all of the, all of the traffic signs, speed limits, lights, everything. There's nothing, yeah. there's no speed limits, there's no traffic lights and everything. And, and the amount of accidents and fatalities have, have dropped to, to pretty much almost nothing. There was a, there were two um, BBC programs actually where they conducted uh, a study, and in one case, uh, in a, on the busy London junction, uh, the lights went out. Okay, which happens periodically. So what do people do? Do they kind of drive crazily through the junction? Okay, no, everybody in that situation slows down. Okay, because you don't know what's going to happen, and so they kind of slow down, and then they come to it, and people give way, and so on and so forth. Um, the same thing happens in the junction near where I live, where every, every Christmas or every winter, rather, because of flooding, the lights at a particular junction tend to go out. And that's exactly what happens. But more importantly, they conducted an experiment in a town, I can't remember where it was. You can, you can find this material on the BBC, um, where the, uh, they had a uh, the, the, there were traffic jams all the time, and the traffic was always backed up. And the, one of the graphic scenes you see is the cameras at this junction, and everybody stopped. All the traffic is stopped and there's fumes everywhere and no one is moving. Right? And so they, they shut the lights down for about a month and they interviewed people beforehand and people said, oh no, my God, it's bad enough now. It's going to be absolute chaos when we take those lights out. So they took the lights out and traffic speeded up. Journeys that were taking 30 minutes took five minutes. Um, the people who wanted to cross the road, the traffic just slowed down. The stop to allow them to cross the road. <laughs> it was amazing. It was like, it was incredible. Anyway, to come back to the thing about the Brehan Law, one thing I do want to make clear, by the way, this is not a libertarian paradise, <laughs> okay? This is, a, this is a radically inegalitarian society. So there's a distinction between slave and free and between noble and non-noble. And you're, it's not the case that everybody is equal before the law. Your position before the law is determined by your status. Right, um, so that's important to understand. Um, but uh, so, so because I think somebody took me up wrongly on something that I wrote, and they were saying, "Oh no, no, this wasn't a libertarian paradise," and that's not the point I was making at all. It wasn't. The other important point about it is that the, the these societies, both in Ireland and in in what would be sort of Anglo-Saxon uh, England and on, on the uh, Germany on the continent, um, the kinship group was the center, if you like, of legal action, not the individual primarily, right? And that is something that, if you like, would be very difficult for any libertarian to swallow. Um, and it, it was because of the kinship group that the law functioned. 
because the kinship group was responsible for the behavior of its members. Right? In, in Irish law, there's a concept known as the dervina, which means the, the true family, and it means all of, all of the descendants of a great-grandfather form a particular kinship group. Right? Um, so they owned land in common. They could also own land individually. But the idea was this. Suppose one of your, one of your kin uh, has a passion for going down to the local pub and starting fights. All right. Well, if he does that and he smashes somebody's tooth, then it's going to cost him money. That's how it worked in Irish law and Brahan law. Right. Um, now, suppose he doesn't actually have any money, then his kinship group becomes responsible for paying it. Right. Now, suppose he murders somebody. Now, in this, this is a classic case. If you murder somebody in that situation, technically, the, the kinship group of the person you murdered had the right to exact the penalty, your life in return. But of course, when that happens, if that's, not, if that's allowed to get out of hand, you get the, um, what do you call it, uh, the Italian word, vendetta, okay? And you, you get the escalation of violence. So every society has an interest, if you like, in, in kind of dampening down the violence. So generally speaking, the kinship group was persuaded to take uh, what, what in Anglo-Saxon terms was a vergelt, in other words, man money, okay? But this was a substantial amount of money. Okay, we're not talking, you know, uh, top and Satan here. So, and again, typically speaking, the person who committed the crime would not have the resources by himself to make that payment. Therefore, his kinship group would have to do it. And I can tell you, they're not happy about this. So, right? so eventually, however, so if this guy doesn't rein in his violence, right, they are going to say he's not part of our kin. Now, what happens then in that situation, a person is outside the law, which means his kin have said that if anyone takes action against him, up to and including killing him, we undertake not to avenge his death. Now, so I give you two possibilities. If you're the person, if you're the gung-ho, uh, violent guy in this place, do you A, hang around the locality, or do you B, get the hell out of there, <laughs> right? which is what happened. This is this is a uh, this is strikingly familiar to uh, to um, uh, what I had learned like years ago, two decades I suppose at this point, um, or a couple at least uh, about uh, Icelandic law, very very similar, um, where you know basically uh, if if you if you kill someone, you have a debt to pay, and if you don't pay it or your kin doesn't pay it then they have then 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 they have a right to kill you in yeah. in, uh, in, yeah. in in fact in fact in Icelandic law if uh, you know for example if you met a stranger on the road and for some reason you had a disagreement and you ended up killing this person you had an obligation to go to the nearest township or person and actually declare this in other words, say, I have killed somebody. Failure to do so was like driving away from an accident and leaving the scene of an accident. Right. In other words, and, and so it would be taken as a, a tacit admission that you were, in fact, guilty yes. in some way. Right? And this kind, of, this kind of would be a good segue into, into discussing that the, the laws back then, there was, no, there was no distinction between civil law no. and what we call criminal law. Everything was civil law. Right. And, and, and so you didn't have you didn't have an, 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 you know, like here in the United States, if you commit a some sort of uh, some sort of, 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 of violation under under statutory criminal law, then the cause of action against you is the people versus, you know, whereas in a civil uh, a civil matter, it's, you know, uh, a person versus you, a business versus you. Um, or I suppose back then it could be, you know, a, a kinship uh, versus an individual or a kinship versus a kinship, but it was all civil. It was all settled with, uh, with, uh, with uh, in, in, in monetary terms. Yep. Yep. Primary. Well, it was quite, um, quite about like, how does the individual and how does the society frame the law? And you can frame it in so many different ways, you know, civil, uh, you can split it, sorry, into civil and criminal. You can split it into all sorts of, Different when you can split it into statutory and common law, you know, predominantly um, written law or predominantly interpreted uh, response to action, you could say. Um, but I think one of the things that I found interesting when I studied law was these light rules that we have that are 
integrated into the common law. Like what were the three that I were to was told was uh, law must be seen to be done, mm. meaning um, you have to have a public trial that is under certain circumstances, otherwise it could be corrupt. Obviously, it's anti-corruption. Uh, what was the other one? Uh, oh, it's better for an innocent per. It's sorry. It's better for a guilty person, a person to, to be let off than it is for an innocent person to be incarcerated, which is another way of saying innocent in proven, until proven guilty. It's a not. It's not really, but it's it's sort of one of those things. Um, and the what was another one? Oh yeah, ignorance is no defense of the law. So no defense. You know, ignorance is no defense. And I used to find that rather unfair because we don't have law lessons as children. But then I, as I grew up, I suddenly realized that actually this selection of 0.01% of psychopathic people or however you might call it, will use any excuse. And most of the law we have, common law more than statute, has been aimed to respond to those people. Well, yeah, no, very good point. Um, another one of those maxims is that a criminal may not profit by his crime. So, for example, if you, mur if you murder you one of your relative from whom you could expect to inherit, but you wanted to speed up the inheritance, uh, you cannot say, well, I'll serve the sentence and then I'll take the money. <laughs> okay, the criminal cannot profit by his crime. Um, but the... That's why you've got to hold the gold, Gerald. <laughs> yeah, I know, yeah. But so a big, a big difference between law and legislation. You see, this is, this is the thing. Um, it, would, it would not be true to say that there wasn't any kind of legislation in these societies, especially as they moved through time, but it was minimal, right? Um, and it tended to be rather the codification of something which had been emerging already, okay? Um, so that, for example, even now, uh, you can find that, say, your legislature will pass a statute, but it's a codifying statute. In other words, it collects together certain legal principles which have emerged uh, through judgments, and it, exp it expresses them in statutory form. So in a sense, it, it, it is a statute, but really it's simply a way of codifying what's already there. There's a big difference between that and a group of people, however we get them, sitting around saying, let's make a law about... And then there is no restriction on what they may make a law about, okay? Um, and then it's published, uh, but it's published in, you know, uh, <laughs> in a journal or the Gazette or wherever it might be, uh, in, you know, and so on. And then and nobody knows anything about it. Now, so while on the one hand, um, you know, it's a little bit, it's a little bit, I often make this joke to my students. I say, when Moses came down from the mountain with the tablets, okay? And I'm just thinking exactly this joke just now. Sorry. Yeah, really? So he comes down and he says, sorry, first of all, a joke. I've got good news and I've got bad news. The good news is down to 10. The bad news is that adultery is still in there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but anyway, so, all right, when he comes down and he says, you know, I've just got the straight word from God, right? And he said, thou shalt not kill. And so what? The Israelites, uh, the Hebrews all stood around saying, damn, there goes our party tonight. We were just planning on killing people sort of randomly, okay? This, this is not news, okay? No society can exist or subsist unless, in fact, it be, it's illegal uh, to kill randomly your conspecifics, the people within your group. People within other groups, different story perhaps and so on. It takes a while to get there. So this is not news. So what's the point? The point is it's something that they already know and understand it now has, if you like, the additional gravitas of divine sanction. Okay. Yeah. Jared, I, had a, uh, I was going to say something about uh, Moses and Mount Ararat, and I, I thought you were going to say the same thing. I said it last week, actually, which was uh, Jordan Peterson said something about his, his view on it, that, that Moses was there in front of his um, people answering. He was basically the lawgiver. Not the, sorry, not the lawgiver. He was basically the judge for years and years and years and years. And then he goes up on Mount Ararat, and, and that is a, that's an emergent property from the experience. It's not that he's just, you know, got 20 and knocked them down to 10 as much as <laughs> And I think that's a good, that's a good um, slither, the good way we can move from law to morality, because my conjecture is that both law and morality are, or should be viewed as emergent properties. And uh, what I mean by that is, uh, there's, a, there's a, a developmental psychologist called Jean Piaget, and he studied children. He's a very famous developmental psychologist. Yes. And what he did is he, there's a long story of him looking at children playing marbles and all sorts of other games. And he gets the children, they all play, and they, they, they play in a way that they're all happy with how it's being played. 
And every so often you get someone who breaks a rule and they're, they're, you know, they're ostracized or however it works in the group. But what he then, what he then did, he took them away and he got them to repeat back to them what they'd done. He said, what are the, what are the rules of this game? And each, each child had a completely different set of rules. And so he, he, he's, he was trying to understand what this meant in terms of our development and what he suggested and has been worked on later by, uh, by some neuroscience scientists called Luria, but don't worry, is that we act out before we understand. And that's where the emergence comes from. So that as a, as a starter, Oli, did you have anything as a thought on that, for example, Oli? Um, well, yeah, I, I want to kind of bring it back to, to where Richard, I think, was, was one, of, one of the things that he wanted to ask about, which was the diff difference between Anglo common law and uh, the Brihon law. And I think both systems, there's some similarities, and I think we're interested in both these systems because um, they've been talked about a lot in libertarian circles. And, and we, as libertarians, we tend to look at the law as, as, as the, an indication of how free our lives, our lives are. And so we, we look at the Brihon law, we look at, um, at the Anglo law, and it was a process of discovering the law right? on a case-by-case -case basis. Mm. Something would happen, and uh, people already have an inner sense of right and, right and wrong, and uh, it's just a matter of discovering what exactly happened in this situation. And so how do we apply our morality to that law? And, and, uh, and it, you know, it forms precedent, and it's... Right. After the Normans, it's recorded in in, in London in an essential repository. Um, whereas in um, in Ireland, as I understand it, and, and Gerard can can correct me, but um, the the Brehons were more like um, they were experts in their particular domain. So different Brehons would be experts in different um, aspects of the law. Like maybe uh, some would be particularly good at uh, property disputes, others at uh, you know, violence or whatever um and so so yeah so I, I can see it as i don't know if morality is emergent but we discover it so mm. does that make sense yeah well i know I, I agree in fact i've written on this and i've made this point uh, i think um fairly clear in my writing lots of things are obscure in my writing but that one i think it's fairly clear um but can i give you another example where which may not seem obvious at the start uh, john locke wrote uh, i know this because i read the book he said god was not so sparing as to make man two-legged and to leave it to aristotle to make him rational now that was a that was a jibe at aristotle but in fact aristotle didn't think that in other words aristotle so Aristotle didn't think that before he came along with his formalized logic, that people didn't know how to argue, didn't understand the argument, didn't understand when the case was made. In fact, they did. What Aristotle did was to reflectively appropriate and codify, if you like, the norms already implicit in people's rational practice. And the reason for doing that is twofold. One, that if you do that, then you become uh, more aware of what it is that you're doing, and B, you become better able to discriminate between good arguments and bad arguments. All right, that's a very important point. But Aristotle's ethics was exactly the same. So, for example, if you if you had signed up for Aristotle's thirty drachma ethics course, and you said, "Oh, teacher, teacher, you know, um, please explain to me." why it wouldn't be a good idea for me to go home now and bash my father's head in with an ax. Aristotle would have said, here's your money. You need to go back and be brought up properly, right? The point of this course is not to answer stupid questions like this. It is, as it were, to reflect on our lived experience of living together and try to understand in the same way that we did with logic, to try to reflect and appropriate I beg your pardon, to reflectively appropriate the principles, the ethical principles that are already, imbo that are already embodied in our practice. Yes. We're not making things up from the start. We are actually simply making explicit what is implicit. It's very much, um, it's very much uh, the, the, to me, uh, the notion of, uh, of, of what we call natural law, yes. which, so in a sense, it's it's there, but it's for us to discover over time, and the law emerges about us understanding more and more about the natural order uh, and 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 what works. And 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 in 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 some ways, 
this is how this is this is why it's, uh, law often reflects the uh, the religious culture uh, mm -hmm. underlying underlying a, a place you, because you know and then there there are the there are the so there's canonical I guess that's how you pronounce it canon law yeah canon law and um, and there's common law there's natural law. And there's um, there's statutory law, so some ways these all kind of mesh together in some way or another. Well, I recommend a book on this. So the, the best thing I've read on that progression of, of of law moving with the society and society moving because the law changes how they behave, and then do you sort of mean the norms progress? Is actually by a man called Albert Van Dyke, and it was written in 1903. Um, and I think it was published in 1905, and it was called um, Law and Public Opinion in 19th Century England. And I absolutely enjoyed that book two or three times, and I, I couldn't recommend it more. He, because he's very meticulous, but he's not over scientific, um, and I just think it's it's such an excellent expression. He's actually famous for for writing on uh, constitutional administrative law, but that's his best book in in my opinion. Could I rec recommend as well a book called Law and Revolution by Ooh, the name escapes me. Um, it's a, a 1980s book. Uh, you get it online if you look it up. Um, it's a 650, 700 pager, which kind of makes your heart sink. Um, but it's a, it's a brilliant piece of writing. Uh, it's Law and Revolution, somebody, Andy, maybe you can look it up there. I'll recognize the name and so on. Brilliant book. But yeah, we'll, we'll, find it, we'll find it and drop it in the, in the notes yeah. on the video. Harold, Harold Berman. Harold Berman, that's the guy, yeah. There's a second volume as well, which is also very good. Not as good as the first, but the first was superlative. So by comparison, it's still a very good book. Yeah, very good book. Um, to, to, to come back to, to um, something which, which was touched on briefly as well, the idea of statute versus, um, versus common law or, or common law. Um, I wanted to say, well, juxtapose that to, to um, what's his name? De, De Juvenel. Uh, his book on power, Andy. Bertrand de Juvenel, yeah, unbelievable book, but incredibly yeah. hard to get through, yeah. So, so, so Harry talks about um, the evolution of, of power, of the state, essentially. Um, and uh, so the, the, the scale of the state's wars, of the king's wars, and the conscription. Um, and and uh, I'm not sure, so sure if he, he delves into the issue of law that much, but um, we can certainly draw parallels with how the statutes have increased in scale and scale uh, and, and how now the modern de democratic state is all about the industrialized production of statute and that this isn't necessarily coming out of uh, a number of, uh, of, uh, of court cases where we're discovering that people are repeatedly uh, committing this offense therefore we need the statute it's, it's, it's coming from things as much as industrial lobbyists as, as anything else and th there's such little accountability and we just have this what seems like a, a huge machine and stopping the machine incessantly is, is producing and consuming us. <laughs> well, no, it's, it's, it's insane. That's all, yeah, absolutely. What I see, what I see is happening is, uh, is us sort of having a big problem with accountability. Like, I don't know, we all see different things, but the whole EU thing and from an English perspective, it's sort of like, uh, I want the people who are, you know, it, within the law, either whether you're talking about a state, a state worker or, or whoever, to be accountable via to the to the level of their responsibility. And I don't think uh, I don't want to get into the EU for and against and Brexit and all that. But I think it's it's accountability is something you always need to have in your mind. Uh, and I don't think we've quite got that right at the moment in England, at least. But it's mm -hmm. it's somewhat axiomatic, right, that <laughs> that um, the EU, by virtue of being a larger state, power is less proximate to us. And ergo less accountable. Okay, one one more book on that. Sorry, um, would be um, Leopold Kerr's uh, Breakdown of Nations. Sorry, I won't keep firing them at you, but that's a very very good book, and that sort of elucidates all these points on on uh, dispensation. Yeah. Hmm. Yes. So, Jared, what are you working on at the moment in terms of? Uh, what are you at the moment? <laughs> I'm glad you asked me that. Give me one moment while I dive. Okay, I'll be back in two seconds. <laughs> <laughs> can you see that it's called zap okay and the subtitle says free speech and tolerance in the light of the zero aggression principle hence the zap 
So yeah, I just finished this. It's um, it'll be out on October the first, and it's an attempt to provide a kind of grounding for those two areas of our life which are very important and um, bring them together. Uh, I make the point that the what we have at the moment in discussions on free speech, which apart from being incredibly annoying <laughs> uh, and very rarely reaching any kind of resolution. And I, I say the reason for that is largely because uh, they're not grounded in any principle. In other words, nobody's saying, why is it that you have a right to say this and so on. And so we have this hodgepodge of laws which say you can say this, you can't say this, or you can say this in these circumstances and so on. Um, and so I argue, I'm arguing that the zero aggression principle provides a basis for a principled approach, uh, which will allow us to make uh, decisions. It's not a free for all because there are limitations. It's limited by property, obviously. Um, and so on. So that area would not, I think, for that area will be new, of course, to people who are not familiar with uh, libertarianism, but not so new to people who are familiar. The stuff on tolerance, however, is, I think, probably new and also. Um, what I, what I argue is that a lot of the nonsense we now see on what I call diversity, D-I-E, versity, okay? D diversity, inclusion, and equality, right? Yeah. Uh, is actually based, is a form of intolerance. And I argue that it's intolerant because it, it is an unwillingness or a willingness to override by, by statute or by legal means um, or by royal power, the result of people's free choices. And therefore, I'm, so I link the two together in, in this book and, and try to provide a grounding. It's a short book. It's, a, you know, it's only about 60,000, 70,000 words. And I've deliberately kept it. Um, oh, it it's not highfalutin. It's, it, I've, I've taken a lot of stuff from newspaper, newspaper reports, uh, lots of idiotic cases, which are, it should give people a laugh, if nothing else. And, uh, and just try to make the point fairly simply and fairly straightforwardly. So I've had a lot of fun doing that. And it'll be out. So buy twenty copies and <laughs> get well, we'll like that as well. Uh, Jared, do you have a website or anything? I haven't even asked. No, no, I don't do websites and I don't do social media or anything of that. I was on Fa I was on Facebook for three days. I got off. Okay, <laughs> and I don't do Twitter. I never have. That's my proudest post. Yes. Okay. Well, that's that's good. Um, there's there's uh, um, there. I'm, I'd like you to, uh, Jared, to um, to address perhaps this. Uh, there's this growing notion. I think that it goes along with what you were saying. There's this uh, growing notion that people have a right to not be offended. <laughs> You'd like to address that? I would. You will not be surprised to find my saying that there is no such right. You know that have a right. In fact. Um, and you don't have a right, obviously. Now I say, look, um, this is again one of these cases where, where when, you, when social norms break down, uh, the, the law tends to invade its space. So I say, look, um, you know, if you're walking on Oxford Street and you see somebody who weighs like 600 pounds, you would not, under most circumstances, walk up to the person and say, hello, you're disgustingly fat. <laughs> okay. Uh, now, not because it's against the law in some sense, but because it's simply good manners means it's not your business, really. Do that. We don't. We don't normally go out of our way to insult people. Okay, and we try our best not to insult them if we possibly can. Okay. So those those norms of conduct are part of what we learn when we grow up. People who are properly socialized tend to absorb these things painlessly. We hardly even know where. We're doing it. Um, have you ever seen what I call the uh, the 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 obstructive two-step? We were walking down the street and sort of thinking about something, and suddenly you realize somebody's coming straight towards you. And of course, what do you do? You, you keep on going. No, no, you move to one side, and then the person who's coming towards you at the same moment moves to the same side, and now you're confronting one another again. And then you move back, and then he moves back, and now you what do you do? Start a fight? Okay, no, you laugh. You say, oh, sorry about that. These things oh, happen and you move on. I always say, let's dance. <laughs> let's dance, yeah. It's a, it's a, kind, of, it's kind of a pedestrian two-step. So many, <laughs> most of these things, yes, we understand under normal circumstances. When you're, you know, if somebody has a problem with something or a word they don't like or a topic they prefer not to discuss, it's polite, you know, and so on. And, and that's fine. 
that's not a problem. What does become a problem is, however, when you make a law prohibiting somebody from talking about this or saying something or preventing them from speaking on a particular topic. So uh, towards the end of my academic career, I used to give a, a meta trigger warning. What's a meta trigger warning? My meta trigger warning was there won't be any trigger warnings in this course. <laughs> okay, that's it. <laughs> okay. Like that. So, and I would say things like, I'm gonna, we're going to talk about anything that, we, that, we, that anybody here finds of interest. If you're, if, you're, if, you're like, if, you're, if you're such a delicate flower that you're likely to be psychologically distraught by this, then take another course. You don't have to take this one, right? I'm the one, again, this is my house, my rules. I'm the only one that determines what the rules are for what goes on in this course, right? And so we will have politeness, but you can disagree vigorously. What you're not allowed to say is you're a great big fathead and stupid, okay? But what you are entitled to say is, I think your opinions aren't sound. I, don't, I think your argument doesn't stand up, and here's why. And you can say that as strongly as you like. Um, so that's, that's the difference. And so we, you'll be glad to hear that I've got a, I've got a, um, a section. I mean, got lots of material in there on the, on the snowflakery that's now endemic in our, in our educational establishments. I just think, my God, I can't believe what's going on. It's, it's just incredible. It's just, yeah. even if it is only a small portion of students, and my guess is that most students are still sane, nonetheless, the fact that this has found a toehold in the university of all places, which would be a bastion of free speech and free freedom, is just incredible. I and also find other... really, really bizarre that, sorry, I find it really bizarre that when I was a student, it was the university authorities who were imposing all of these rules and restrictions and preventing us from doing things. Now, it's the students who are doing it, student on student, or indeed the students persuading the authorities to act on their behalf to prevent other students from speaking in particular ways. Quite bizarre, quite bizarre. Then, um, yeah, you have the, um, what are they, the student, they're like student, um, Unions, student Union. courts or something. Uh, there was just a, a decision handed down by a circuit court here, um, a scathing opinion. Uh, uh, regarding some person who was, uh, you know, kicked out on just just another person's say so alone, and there was there was the due process. I mean, it was, it's like it's amazing to read. It's 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 you know it would make a kangaroo court blush. Uh, Richard, <laughs> I'm going to say at this point here. Look at anyone who hasn't looked up Lindsay Shepherd uh, in in Canada, then look that story up. She the, the short version is that she. Um, was playing some Jordan Peterson video in her class on culture and someone complained that it was, you know, some ist of another, you know, misogynist, this is. And so she decided to uh, go to the kangaroo court, the three, the three people in charge of, of telling her, you know, why, what she did was wrong and why it was wrong. And she recorded it. And that recording is on YouTube and you can hear it. You can hear it. And if you haven't, anyway, it's, it's, a, brilliant, it's a brilliant thing to watch. I think that was uh, actually she was uh, she uh, actually uh, ended up um, he's she's collaborated with uh, with Dr. Peterson in some mm -hmm. some form or another I, I recall that. Mm -hmm. yeah. But well, I think they, everyone know. who keeps trying to take him down keeps keeps making him stronger. So it's sort of it's kind of hilarious. I'm not saying he's perfect. I'm just saying it's a man who's who's doing his best to help the world, and he's you know everyone's going to get a, a little bit of uh, hero syndrome, aren't they? And, and get a bit you know talk about yourself and repeat yourself and. You know, I listen to him now and I think almost nothing he says I haven't heard before. But I think what, what I've got to realize is at the moment of hearing it, when it, when it had that sort of banal, profound thing where you hear something, you think, I agree with this. And you, and you can either see it as profound or banal and you, and you play with it. That, the profundity kind of dies, like with a song. If you hear an amazing song 50 times in a row, it, it's sort of, but the message and that, that learning that can come from it, if you, if you put it into action, I think doesn't die. So, so yeah. anyway, I have respect for that, man. Yeah. No, I agree. No, I, I, I familiar. I, I did listen to that recording, and it was it is absolutely astonishing. It's, it's just, uh, it's mind blowing. But I found, in, in my last years uh, as a teacher, which were perhaps the most enjoyable uh, time I ever had as a teacher, that the students in my class, which was called Anarchy Law in the State, by the way, so because <laughs> you know it says it all, and students came in, and uh, so I would have on average, I had about fifty people in the in the class of whom somewhere between five or seven would be members of the Socialist Workers' Party. And they were great. They, once, once they understood the rules, we weren't playing any silly games, you weren't going to be penalized for disagreeing with me and so on. And then, and then, and then we had these amazing discussions. In fact, they got so good that at times I could have left the room and nobody would have noticed that I'd, I'd gone. And uh, the students would, would go 
to the student restaurant afterwards and spend three or four hours arguing among themselves about what they were doing and fighting about it and coming back again and asking and so on. It was great. Um, you know, nobody complained. I just wish, uh, Gerard, that I'd, there, were, there had been more people like you at university when I was there. Mm. I mean, one of the reasons I was um, leaning more to the left in those days was because there was nothing else. Yes. You know, if, you, if you had an interest in political economy or philosophy or politics, that, 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 was, that was, you, you, the spectrum was from, you know, uh, Democrat, you know, uh, left, typical left-wing Democrat to, to full-on Nazism. Yes, I, I was doing uh, I was doing an economics course, and uh, the, the the lecturer was, was a Marxist, and I could tell. And even though I wasn't, I knew enough about it to uh, deliver a presentation to him from a Marxist perspective on, of all things, foreign direct investment. <laughs> and I got a first class. I got a first class for this presentation. Yeah. After the presentation, he comes up to me and he says. I'm a member of this party. I don't know if you'd be interested in joining. It's the Socialist Party. This was a business economics class. Seriously. Getting recruited into a far, far left-wing organization. Wow. There was just nothing really of, of free market economics to get my, my yeah. teeth uh, something. Uh, amazing stuff. It's, it's rather remarkable that we hear, the, we hear this drumbeat of diversity you know, everywhere uh, amongst the left. Um, but the but the but the thing that there uh, of which there is zero diversity or allowance for any diversity is in thought. Everybody has to think exactly the same thing. Have you read my book? <laughs> 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 I make this point of, in saying, yeah, diversity everywhere. Okay, but no diversity in in what you're allowed to think. Especially if if one of the things you think is that the doctrine of diversity isn't all this cracked up to be. That's not acceptable. Yeah. Although, funnily enough, um, one of the things I quote is from a, a, an editorial in the Georgetown University student paper called the Hoya, where they, they said, we would actually like to have some more conservative professors on our campus because, A, we have to go out into the real world and we're sort of living in a little bubble here. So it would be good to hear alternative views and it would be good not only for people who are conservative, but for people who are actually on the, on the left liberal side of things as well, so that they would actually have some, so it wouldn't come as an existential shock when they discover that the world outside, the rarefied uh, atmosphere of academia wasn't quite what it was and so on. So I found that amusing. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah. The way I look at uh, a lot of these things is to try and not vilify or uh, exalt any single area too much. So if we feel that, you know, the world's a bit intolerant, let's not say tolerance is the answer. Let's say maybe a little bit more tolerance may be an answer, maybe, in our opinion. Uh, and the same way with, with, with all sorts of these things that we, you know, we vilify this particular action or that particular. I'm not talking about lying, stealing and cheating. I'm talking about um, areas because a lot of the people I talk to on Facebook and, and Richard knows these, people, knows these people, they're always trying to sell intolerance. And I was like, why are these people trying to sell intolerance? And then a lot of my friends who, from school or people I knew who have any, any left-leaning um, feelings at all, they will, they will always try and sell tolerance. And I was sort of thinking, hold on a minute, and then you've got the libertarian, and I was thinking, let's just look at this, this conception of tolerance again, because I'm very pro-tolerance and all these things and all the very libertarian ways. But then I looked at Kurt, for example, and other people, sorry, Jared, if you don't know who this, people who, who I speak to about these sorts of things. And it, it's sort of like, you've got to delineate the tolerance because what you're not saying is, oh, I'll tolerate uh, a loose lifestyle. I'll tolerate this. I'll tolerate lack of structure. I'll tolerate, I know it's kind of obvious, but you really, I don't think the idea of selling tolerance as a, as a, as a perfect you know, antidote is is, a, is necessarily a good idea? I'm actually sorry, and I'm not sure I quite understand that. But maybe we're operating with different notions of tolerance. Okay, so tolerance for me is the willingness to put up with things. Uh, tolerance of its very nature implies a negative judgment. In other words, you don't tolerate. I don't tolerate pizza. I love pizza. Yeah. So if, if you bring to me, or it could be anyone. Let's say you you cook for me a, a pizza every Friday because that's what you do. You come over and you make me a pizza, and I play. I teach you chess or something. I don't know. And each time, you know, the first couple of times you burn the pizza, and and I don't know. Maybe maybe you're just making the pizza for me. And at some like, if I'm tolerant of that for 10, 15 weeks, 
this is obviously a silly example, I may build up some, some unwitting resentment towards you, all these sorts, I don't know, all sorts of complicated things. Whereas if on the first time, I, it's a silly example again, but I say, sorry, Jared, but you, like you've burnt the pizza. I, I really don't like burnt pizzas. Anyway, if you cook it, you could do it. I don't, I, I don't mean to be rude. Do you know what I mean? I nip it in the bud. And that I think is how these people who are framing intolerance as good are framing it. Because when I first started to read it, I was thinking, why are they, they're sort of signaling each other, you know, sort of I'm a man. No, I'm more of a man. No, I can be more intolerant. And I was thinking, what is going on here? And I think, as you said, it's that conception of tolerance. It's, 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 it's a very tricky thing. Sorry, carry on. What do you think about that? No, no I, it's just that, okay, so tolerance is not validation. It's not respect. It's not liking. It's not any of these things. It's simply tolerance. Okay. And it simply says, um, I may not like what you're saying. I may not like what you're doing. But if it doesn't, if it doesn't infringe zero aggression principle, then I don't have to like it. I don't have to respect it. Okay. I just have to let you get on with it. Okay. By the way, that's perfectly consistent with my telling you, if the circumstances arise, subject to the normal dictates of politeness, that I don't like what you're doing and I don't like what you're saying and I can do so robustly. So it's, um, the trouble with tolerance is that it's become, to I, I argue in, in my book that tolerance has now become intolerable, right? which is really strange. Okay, because so there's a UNESCO definition of tolerance which says it, it involves the respect and the appreciation of other things. I go, no, it doesn't. Right? That's just nonsense. Okay, respect and appreciation or respect and appreciation. Okay, yeah. uh, well, most of the things that other people do don't concern me at all. I don't care. They watch one what they want to watch stupid TV programs. Do I care? No. Okay, so almost everything that everybody else does doesn't impinge upon me in any way whatsoever. But some things that they say do. So, for example, the, the example I give has to do in particular with um, one form of protected protection in our society, which is becoming increasingly common, which is uh, the, the inability now to give, uh, to say anything that would offend somebody's religious sensibilities. And I'm going, okay, well, I don't go out of my way to do that. I'm a religious believer myself, and I'm not particularly keen on having people offend my religious sensibilities. But in the end, okay, that's life. Okay, life's tough. Okay, um, if somebody doesn't, doesn't like, you know, your religion and wants to say rude things about it, well, Okay, you, first of all, if they're in your company, you don't have to stay in their company, you can leave. If it's online, switch to another channel, okay, do something else. There's a, one of the cases I report in my book is about a, a, a Christian street preacher from Nigeria who was picked up by the cops uh, so, uh, somewhere in London and uh, because one of the passersby took offense at what he was saying and was threatening him. So when the cops came, they didn't actually arrest the person who was threatening him, they arrested him right? Confiscated his Bible, took him off in a cop car and dumped him somewhere in the outskirts of London with no money and no way of getting back. And I thought, wow, that's the way you do things, right? Jared, they've got all sorts of funny stories of, of, uh, of crimes that have happened by, you know, the, the thief or the murder or whatever. And they, as the police come, they go, look, and they direct them and then they run off. The police <laughs> um, Ollie, I was wondering if, sorry, if Jared didn't know what I was saying there. When these conversations come up on, we, we use Facebook as a medium to discuss, you could use Reddit or email. Um, when people, let's say Kurt and co, Ollie, uh, bring up intolerance and they, they do that sort of signaling to each other of, of how intolerant can I be? Like, do you see them as seeing a completely different way to Jared and I? Or do you, like, would you see some value in it? What are your, what are your views on all this? Uh, I noticed um, there's an internet browser called Firefox, which you've probably heard of, and um, they've got an interesting history. Um, the guy who started Mozilla invented JavaScript. He got fired from the company because he had, uh, I guess, homophobic views or was deemed to have had homophobic uh, views or whatever. I think he financed a lobby group which was against uh, homosexuality and he was shamed and, and you know, kicked out from Mozilla. Um, but I think the company still has kept a lot of uh, his ethos, not to say about uh, homosexuality, but about privacy, because that's what Firefox was, was what they were, one of their main things is. And uh, I've noticed recently their slogan is to do with respect. And I thought that was a, a brilliant kind of counterpunch to, to the idea of tolerance. I, 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 when, I th when I think of uh, people on the internet um, signaling uh, intolerance, uh, let's say to the right, and then there's people on the left signaling tolerance. 
I mean, both groups are intolerant by virtue of they're both pushing towards the extremes. They're both out. So yeah, one uses one one word, the other uses the other word. But and on its face, we, we accept the words that they're using. We, we, we take the rights using uh, intolerance, and the left is all about tolerance. But the left is not about tolerance. Or the, mm. the far left is not about tolerance. It's a lie. Mm. Uh, at least the right has the honesty to say, yeah, we're, we're being intolerant. <laughs> Um, so that's my perspective. Um, I'm not sure if that helps or something. Mm. It's um, it's interesting if you you start turning these phrase, tolerance intolerance around in your head and and how kind of closely related these ideas are to like victimhood status and virtue signaling. So in in other words, you have so many people trying to play these roles to, to play the victim where they just don't, they don't have to, you don't have to show up, you know, like the old, the old thing, like turn it, turn off the, turn the knob, turn the knob on, turn to a different channel. Do this. You don't have to, you, you don't have to tolerate or end tolerate. You can just not partake in it. Right. <laughs> so, to, yeah. you know, tolerance, tolerance to me is more something that, is 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 represents some sort of a trade-off like say you have a job for the most part you like your job but there's some aspects of it you don't hmm. well you you tolerate those because you're making a trade-off with the with the greater good of the stuff you're receiving that makes sense hmm. i like to make a distinction between what i call intellectual intolerance and practical intolerance so because I think the two are often confused and I think it doesn't help discussion. So let me give you an example. If, uh, let me, a non-trivial example. So if, for example, if you're a Buddhist or a Hindu, then you have to be intellectually intolerant of all forms of theism, right? Because that's contrary or contradictory to what you believe. It doesn't mean that you have to go out and kill theists, okay, or hate them, or do anything else for that matter. It doesn't imply any practical implications whatsoever. It simply means you cannot at the same time believe A and not A, right? That's, so the, the price of having any beliefs at all is that you have to be intellectually intolerant of the contrary or contradictory of those beliefs, okay? That's a given. But that, you, you have no idea, by the way, how much of a shock this comes when you try to explain it to your students. Okay, so I'm, I'm a Christian, and therefore, for example, I have to be intellectually intolerant, for example, of forms of polytheism. Now, by the way, that's perfectly consistent with my having taught a course in Eastern philosophy for 30 years, <laughs> okay, as it turns out, right? Um, so that's, that's intellectual intolerance. Practical tolerance, however, is a different story, and it's a question of uh, what are you prepared to put up with? I don't know if any of you are familiar with the... Um, What's that? Uh, oh gosh, that um, cartoon program. Um, it they have they have the it's it's but there's a there's the museum of tolerance. I can't remember. There's an episode. Can anybody help me out on this one? Uh, oh, it's it's marvelous. Anyway, sorry. What what? Okay, we're all talking. I'm talking elliptically here. There's an example. There's one of these on the on the vulgar side of the the kind of cartoon ones. You know, sort of really for adults rather than children, and um, where. The, in this particular case, there's a teacher in the school, and he turns out he's homosexual, fine. And he, he then, he's having a chat with the principal, and it's, the principal reveals that if they fired him because he was homosexual, he would actually be able to sue them for millions. And so he devises this plan. So he's going to behave outrageously and get fired and collect all the money. So he behaves outrageously and ever more outrageously, and all he gets is the Courageous Teacher of the Year Award. <laughs> Okay. And in the end, he gets so frustrated, he, he goes, guys, this is ridiculous, right? I mean, and they, they, all the parents are saying, well, we're supposed to be tolerant. And he said, yeah, but this is, this is, this is, this is, it, 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 he's talking about the Museum of Tolerance. He said, if it was, if you were supposed to like it, it would be called a Museum of Acceptance, not the Museum of Tolerance. <laughs> okay. He said, you tolerate a crying baby sitting next to you on the plane, right? That's tolerance, but nobody should, and it goes on to say, but that's the point. So it's a very funny episode. So it makes the point, you know, appropriately. So in most cases, again, as, as I was, the point I was making earlier, that in the, in the, uh, in the everyday hurly-burly, we regulate our lives, 
uh, the social norms have emerged and that properly socialized people understand these things and deliberately, uh, sorry, do not deliberately go out of their way to give offense. However, um, as Frank Freddy makes in his book, his excellent book on tolerance, by the way, if you haven't read it, uh, is that, you know, when you're having a serious discussion with another person, okay, then uh, where you are committed to what you're doing, it's not a matter of indifference, when you're both committed, then you must express yourself robustly and strongly, okay, at the same time, refrain from saying your views are completely stupid and not an idiot would hold them. But nonetheless, I, I believe that what you understand here is actually false and let me tell you why. And you have to be prepared to listen to the other person saying the same thing and why. So it's perfectly consistent with robustness, but most of the time you're not actually called upon to do anything except just mind your own business. Now how revolutionary is that? <laughs> Yeah, I, I think a lot of a lot of people have such different views as, uh, of the world, and and I've tried to experience time with as many different types of people as possible. Obviously, not as broadly as I'd like. I've you know gone gone across the world, but but different people in my within my ambit. If someone strikes me as having an odd or peculiar view, but their their view, their philosophy, or let's call it um, their mo, is kind of consistent and integrated, and I sort of try and learn from them, and I, and I think. Oh, yeah. And it, it's, a, it's a strange thing, though, that we have this, let's call it libertarian bend, or, or I like to think of it as an autonomy bend, autonomy versus authority, or authority, however you like to look at it, liberty versus authority. And I think that, that there are people out there who are so, they value subjectively, um, so let's call it security over autonomy. Again, you can put two, any two things up with each other. And I think the way they live their life, person to person, for me to impose on them and say, you know, I want this libertarian, this or have what I wanted is not does not only come across arrogant, which I think it slightly is and misplacedly arrogant, but it, it's it's very hard to actually see how that how they value those things so highly. I'll give you an example. It's a very 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 off offset example, but so I was chatting to my ex girlfriend and we'd been going out for a few months, and I was trying to tell her a funny anecdote of of telling my best friend a lie on purpose to try and explain an idiocy within his, his, his character. And this is, the story was more her reaction than the story, but the story goes like this. So my friend Jack and I went to the pub. We were, we were 17, I think, and we were sort of under drinking. And uh, it was in Wimbledon, and there was a, a girls' school called Wimbledon High, and a few of the Wimbledon High girls were there. And the traditionally best-looking one, who was called Tamsin, she was at the bar, and I said, uh, I said uh, how are you doing, Jack? Um, you want a drink? And I said... Uh, you want, to, you want to Guinness? He said, oh, is, uh, do you think she's good looking? And I, it really, it was a really strange comment because I wasn't quite sure why he asked it. So I thought I'd say, obviously she was stunning. And I thought, I said, no, to be honest, mate, no, I wouldn't, I, not my, not really. And he went, no, no, neither do I. And so <laughs> as I told my girlfriend, I thought it was kind of silly. And my point there was that he had such little, uh, you know, faith in his own beliefs. Well, he had so, such little gumption. Anyway, when I told my girlfriend at the time, she looked, she had a red face and kind of was in, like, had her, and looked at me with, like, with eyes like that. And I thought, hold on a minute. And it suddenly dawned upon me that she, not only did Jack think in this way, but she thought in this way. And, and it's nothing wrong with it. It's not like I can look down and go, oh, you know, look, I can, I can make my own decision. What you say about this girl won't affect what I say. But it's literally a different perspective. Sorry, long-winded way of saying, I, that's my tolerance. I try to tolerate different perspectives that, that are honest. Well, what can I say? I agree. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, if I have a besetting sin, and I have many, one of them is intellectual curiosity. So if I, when, when I meet somebody with different views, I, I, I ask them, I say, tell me about it. You know, uh, I explore them. That's so, I'm not rushing to judgment. I just want to find out what you think, why you believe what you do. And I think that's actually uh, showing an interest in the other person. I don't do it to that. I'm interested in what they have to say. Yeah. But I, one, one thing I, I used to do very early on in my anarchy law in the state it was I'd ask a question, some fairly obvious question, and I would get an answer from a student. And then I would go silent for a couple of seconds, and I would say, are you sure? And they would go, uh, um, well, uh, well um, yeah, and I'd, and I'd say, I'd say, well, you're right. I said, and don't ever let anybody else ever intimidate you like I just did. <laughs> okay, if, if you think you know it, okay, stand by it. Be prepared to stand up. It doesn't matter who 
does it, right? Don't let anybody ever do that to you that's, again. That's excellent. And, and in fact, in fact it's, 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 it's somewhat difficult um, to, to do because you, you really, you know, when someone says that, you know, uh, are you sure, right? Then it's, it's as though they're disagreeing that, that it's mm-hmm. wrong. And, and, then, and so you have, to, you have to really kind of double down on it mm-hmm. and not doubt yourself. But, it, but, it, but another thing is, it's, it's a good question because sometimes, sometimes it does, it, it exposes to yourself that you actually do have doubts and maybe you need to rethink it a little bit more. Hmm. I've got a vague memory, Richard, of playing you at chess and, and, and twice saying, are you sure? And on both occasions, you, uh, you went ahead. <laughs> anyway. Do okay. we have chess players here? I spend but an enormous amount of time every day playing game. chess. <laughs> oh, Jared, you, are you on chess.com? I'd love to oh, give I you certainly am, yes. Oh, yes. brilliant. Well, we'll exchange details later. I'd love oh, to give you a gift. That would be fantastic. I've just got Richard back into it, and he's, he's made a quip about me not being able to make him a master player within six months or something. I actually, I have, a, I have an inkling that I can, I can get him better than he realizes. <laughs> but he puts the time in, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they will work. <laughs> Ollie, do you play chess? You've got to join the crew. I, I play chess very rarely. Uh, uh, there's a colleague at work every couple of months who have a game. So. You know what a knight does anyway. As long as you know what a knight does, you're fine. <laughs> what, what, is it I told, I, what is it I told you, Andy, that the only way I'll ever attain master status is uh, to attain omniscience? And, when, when, and if, you, if you had omniscience, then every game would be pretty boring. <laughs> right? Yeah, you see, I, when I play chess, I have these great plans. It's just that the other guy keeps messing them up. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I've just been watching all these old games and, these, and how each person, had, if you watch Kasparov games or Karpov games or Alekhine, sorry to chess diverge, but give me yeah, yeah. Um, So my favorites probably be Kasparov, number one. I like watching Bobby Fischer. I like yeah, Alekhine. Yeah. I like Capablanca. I like Morphe. And I like Tar. I, I like Tar, if I haven't said already. And players that I'm less interested in are sort of Spassky, Karpov, Kramnik. They're very much positional players. They'll, they'll grind you down and they'll, they'll shift, and shift until you make the error and then they come in. And I think a player like, like Carlson has it all, so I won't even talk about him, but a player like Anand or K- uh, Kasparov, they're so tricky. And if you, if you study their games, it, it's almost like their character comes out in their chest, like, like a pianist. And it's fantastic because I've watched the, um, a lot of the Alpha Zero games, which is a, a computer a program. Mm-hmm. And, a, and 99% of the games, 99.8% of the games, I think it's two in every thousand or so, are not terrible. They're really good quality, but they're dead games. There's nothing there. And, and it's, it's, I think there's something about computation there that, that they're almost killing the game. They're making the preparation. Instead of having a six move you know, opening or an eight, you've now got the Karakhan into the 15th move. Oh yeah, or even, or even further. Yeah. Well, we won't talk about that because nobody else is interested. No, no, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> um, anyway, what are, you, what are you all working on now in terms, of, in terms of anything? Richard, I haven't heard from you. What are you doing with yourself at the moment? I'm, I'm um, uh, right now. I'm trying to um, sell my house up here in the uh, in the um, mountains of uh, the Sierra Mountains, uh, Central California, about four thousand two hundred foot elevation. Whoa! It was our second home for for many many years, and um, but uh, um, it's been primary for the last two or three. And uh, I'm just not a fan of the winters. I grew up about the same elevation in, in Reno. And so I, I've had, you know, I skied at Tahoe, you know, as a kid. And I have, I have I, you know, I've, I have my, I've had my time in the snow. So this, this place was great uh, as, a, as a getaway and a, a vacation home and, you know, holidays, holidays and stuff like that. But uh, so I'm going to get rid of it. And I'm going to kind of go nomad in a... Oh. Uh, in a camper for a while, see Whoa. what happens. See what happens. So that's what I'm up to. You're going to travel around? Yes, yeah, so I have this. Uh, um, I have. I, I want to. I've been, you know, dabbling in, you know, blogging and um, social media and uh, stuff for for quite a while. And I try want to kind of distance myself. So that's why I applauded uh, uh, Jared when you were talking about uh, not being on social media. It's like kind of my dream. <laughs> to not, have, not do it anymore and spend so much time yeah. at it and actually have real world connections. So like uh, about a year or so ago, uh, I, I made this rule for myself that I have to, I have to go, I have to get out of the house, like go down to the coffee shop or the market or something like that. 
and I have to strike a, up a conversation with at least uh, one person every single day. So I have like <laughs> real, real human contact. Uh, with, with, uh, that's that's pretty, I've that's pretty this, extreme, Richard. <laughs> I've got this recent view, actually, that it's probably warping my life, but there we go, that um, long, long periods alone, especially for some reason for men, kind of drive us a little bit insane. And I think the opposite of that, there's something about being a social creature that, you know, like if, if terrible things happen to me or most people, they draw in, they go in their room for a day or they, you know, this. And sometimes you need to go through that experience. Actually, a lot of the time you do, but to pull yourself out of it, I find, I either, it sounds odd, I clean my room, I had a haircut, actually I had a haircut yesterday, obviously I was stressed. Um, <laughs> or, I, um, or I talk to someone, I go and see, I think, oh, I can't be, I'm not, I'm not in the mood to do this, I've got this plan here, but at the end of that, I'm going to go and see someone. And even though I... I oddly at the time might not feel like seeing that person. Very rarely do I get to them and think, oh, well, waste of my time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. How about you, Holly? What are you up to? Um, I'm kind of on a five-year plan at the moment. Uh, oh, that I'm, sounds very Soviet. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, because I've been, I've been uh, self-employed for many, many years, and um, I really enjoy that. That's what I, I, where I'd, I like to be. But um, it hasn't been making me as much money as I would like it to make. So uh, about a year and a bit ago, I decided to sell my soul to the corporate sector. <laughs> so I'll, be, I'll continue doing that for the next four years or so, um, just to raise some money and, and build up some capital. And uh, hopefully after that, get back into the free market properly and All right. start helping some uh, small and medium businesses and some startups get, get going. All right. Um, so pretty much that, doing a bit of traveling. I view it as a holiday, to be honest. I find the work quite easy and pay too much. But that's <laughs> <laughs> well, it's better, than, it's better than having the uh, the work, uh, was it the pay too easy and the work too much, right? Well, that's what it was yeah, when, when I was self-employed. But to be honest, I missed a bit. I missed that business. I missed that, that, that life. The only thing I miss about academia are, are my students. I don't miss the administration. I don't miss my colleagues for the most part. Uh, I don't miss the commute, any of it, but I really do miss the, 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 I found, I mean, despite all of the bad things that are said about students, by and large, I found most students, most of the time, to be open-minded and to be energetic and to be, you know, uh, open to, to conversation and so on. And I just, I mean, certainly for the last eight or nine years of my life, when I was teaching this course as a sort of center of what I was doing, I had so much fun, I felt it was kind of sinful, actually, to take payment for it. Okay, it was, it was like, oh, it was great. Well, do you know in the ancient era in Greece, was it the University of uh, Cairo? They used to have, this is long, all way back when, before Paris and Bologna and, and all that. Um, they would have, you would just speak and people would give you money as, as they could, as far as I've read. I think that's who's, who's uh, Discovery of Freedom. What's the lady who writes the book called Discovery of Freedom? Anyway, it's in that book. I forget her name. Um, but yeah, I thought we'd finish, guys, with just talking about... Um, bringing people together. So I met Jared at my conference and then actually we met again at PFS. Uh, and I was thinking of hosting or co-hosting something in Portugal, Jared. I don't know how you are with, with flying these days or what, what your schedule is. So I wouldn't want to impose anything, but at some time in the next year, let's say in the next 14 months, probably between six and 14 months time, I'm going to have something to do with something in, in near Lisbon. I thought all three of you are of, of course invited and Jared, I'd love you to speak there if you, if I'm not putting you on the spot. No, it's just I have to say I've developed a kind of a mild fear of flying. Okay. So I've only been out of Ireland once in the last five years, and that was actually to London in January of this year, where I was externing for a thesis in Kings. Um, so I'm so I have a mild aversion to that. I have a much more than mild aversion to airports and airport security. I, I just find this is going to sound awfully precious, but it's really an affront to my dignity. I just, I just, I just hate the whole thing. Uh, it's just, I mean, I'm not smuggling drugs and I don't have any explosives and so on, but I just, I feel like I'm being treated as a criminal from the moment I entered the building until I leave the airport building at the other side. And I just hate that. So Jared, well, I went, I went to Menorca a couple of weeks ago and I hadn't been on holiday in four years. You know, I hadn't been holiday in a beach holiday since I was probably a child. And I found that the experience of the airport almost, I had to overcome for a day and, or day and a half. And I was only there a few days. And then I came back and I was, and I'm not, you know, I'm pretty thick skinned, but it's, it's a horrible, horrible experience. I mean, have, have you had any experiences like that, Richard or Ollie? I can, I can say, 
because I, I do travel quite a lot and have done for many years. I'm usually abroad four or five times easily a year. Um, and I've gotten quite good at avoiding the most uh, humili humiliating aspects of, of going through airport security. And um, just to make sure you're not carrying any any metal or anything that will set off the detectors. And mm. so I never get searched and I never go through the, the radar the, the radar machines. You know, I, I never have that problem. So mm. I've learned to do it just through experience. Right. Um, but I completely sympathize with Gerard. I uh, you know, ever since this is this has happened since basically since two thousand and one, the terrorist attacks on New York. But um, like certainly the past eight years, it just seemed to take a notch up. And I, mm. I hate the experience. I think tra people travel too much though, actually, at the moment. And so hopefully less people will travel. But <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you were asking, uh, I, you know, it's, it's, it's not, I don't travel a great deal. Um, so it's, it's not, it's pretty, pretty infrequent, uh, you know, by air. Um, and uh, so, it's, I, I've never really had like uh, too much of an, a completely awful experience, but you know, uh, in just a few days, next Tuesday, you know, I'm headed out. So it's, it's multi legs from, you know, San Francisco to Heathrow to Warsaw, Warsaw to Madrid, Madrid to Milan. Milan to Madrid. Uh, Richard, that, can you that, tell that. us a little bit about what you're, what you're doing there? What's that? Can you tell I, us a little I, bit about I, what you're doing? I'm speaking at a conference, um, the 21 convention. Uh, it's run by Anthony Johnson, 21 Studios. And he, he started a, a, this a conference. It's a men's conference. Um, back when he was like 17, 18 years old, he's, he's 12 years into it. And he does multiple conferences. Uh, most of the time they're in Orlando. Um, but every now and then he'll, he's done one in the UK. He's done one in Australia. He's done a few abroad. And so this, this time it's in Warsaw, Poland. Wow. And um, I've spoken at it three times before, going back to two, so 2011, 2012, and then again in 2017 in Orlando and Austin, Texas. This time it's going to be in, uh, in uh, Madrid. The title of my speech is The History and Cancer of Feminism. <laughs> my <laughs> next book. What? You read my next book as well, not just this oh, one, but the next one. I was going to ask you if you were going to work, uh, be working. Yeah, on it. I, I've done. I've done the research, and I'm writing it up at the moment. Can you send me your notes? No, <laughs> no. You, you, but you can buy the book in about six months. I hope. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Um, okay. Anything? Anyone have any uh, el anything else to say? I'm going to stop the uh, the recording after that, and then I would like the guest to stay on with me for a for a mute for a minute because a couple things I want you know, um, um, you know housekeeping things I want to talk about. Sounds good, Jared. Thank you so much for your time and Ollie as well. And I hope to see you guys soon and we'll keep in touch. All right, Andy. Very good. Good. Good to meet you, Ollie. Good to meet you, Richard. Thank you. Hello, Hello. Thank, Thank you. you.